There we go. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Like I said, welcome back. Is anyone here? Is, is this or is anyone new this week? No, no, at least not on camera. Um, OK, cool. Then I will proceed as planned. We did uh, a little bit of a feedback survey and I did a little check in with that. Um, just to see what questions or comments come up. I know in the small groups last week, there was some conversation about, you know, how do we make sure people know, how do we communicate that all out to this, um, to the wider world? That's a little bit what I was gonna get into today. Um, and so uh, I'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, and someone else asked a question about, uh, taught, wanted to ask questions about dealing with resistance, about being fully inclusive. Um, in congregations through education. And I think both of those are really, really valid. Um, so I'm gonna try to address both those. I have a few notes. We're gonna use a similar structure last week because we are so small. Oh, we're not so small anymore. We just added a whole bunch more people. Um, I'll give them a second just to get their audio connected. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, just getting ourselves started uh, right now. We just did some of the introductory stuff. Um, this week, uh, I was going to focus a little bit on the external witness, which does kind of draw a line between what we what came up in some of the conversations and the small group discussions last week um, about, you know, how to um, how to make sure people know that we're a welcoming place and how do we live into that and what's the balance between saying we're welcoming and then actually living into it and making sure the congregation is and someone that comes in really has a good experience. One thing I will recommend, um, my book doesn't totally address that because it's so youth ministry focused, um, but if you are not familiar with the organization Reconciling Works, they are a really helpful resource for both um, for overall congregation process discussion. The Reconciling in Christ process is a really good process to go through, even if you already are Reconciling in Christ, or even if you think that's a ways off for you, just learning some of that can do a lot of the groundwork because and I used to train for Reconciling in Christ. Um, the biggest chunk of the work happens before any official process begins. It is relationship building, it is listening, it is values, it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's, um, it's unofficial work. And people don't realize that they wanna jump into like education sessions right away, but the relationship part is really important. So look at that, look at their Reconciling in Christ resources, check them out. Uh, I will even type their URL in the chat. Hopefully I spelled that right. Um, if I didn't, someone correct me in the chat. Um, and so that can be a really helpful piece that also talks about how to do some of this internal stuff for the overall congregation. Again, my focus is more specifically on the youth ministry aspect. And one of the cool things is we can be more accepting, more inclusive in our youth ministry than the overall congregation can be. And so there is also recognizing that maybe the youth room is the safe space um, if the overall congregation isn't necessarily the safe space, even while we're working to make the overall congregation and our overall um, denomination church be more welcoming as well. But for the most part today, what I wanted to focus a little bit on, and this is where my brain has been a lot lately, has been on thinking about what youth ministry looks like for youth that will never enter our churches. Um, and that we've got young people um, that are hearing a lot of mixed messages um, and maybe have a lot of their own feelings about what Christianity is, what the Lutheran church is. Maybe they're against it. Maybe they're just indifferent and don't really care either way, um, which is totally fine, which is fine. Um, that's a mission field. It's a place for us to make sure that our message is consistent. Um, so last week, I told you to think about doing an assessment of your community and to figure out what resources exist for a young LGBTQ person. And maybe your congregation is one of those, maybe it's not. Uh, there might be programs at your school, you might have an LGBT community center, um, you might have a youth service center, depending on how big or small your town is. Um, those are all things that can exist in your, uh, in your town or your city or your state. Um, and that's th those are the beginnings of how to think about doing youth ministry for youth that are outside of your congregation as well. These are your best, most natural partners. I tend to think of advocacy and youth ministry as like a series of concentric circles. 
and you kind of put the individual, the youth sort of at the center of it and who's their most, uh, and who are the, the, the spheres of influence around them. It's their family and friends, right? Their closest relationships. And then it's the congregation and then it's the community and then it's the state and then it's the nation and then it's the world, right? So we're expanding out and out and out. And the thing is God exists in all of those communities. You can run across through the center and the center still is there with the individual, but the cross still exists in all of these other concentric circles that we have. So if, we're, um, if, if we wanna figure out how to do some of that engagement, a little bit is kind of being aware of what is happening in the outside world and happening with young LGBTQ people. And I do this presentation a lot at GLAAD, um, but I, I talk a lot about what laws exist that either protect or harm LGBTQ youth and how that has changed. And I bring this up especially this year because this was, uh, this was a legislative season that saw an unprecedented number of bills that were specifically aimed at uh, harming transgender youth specifically. And if you are in a state that, uh, that had that passed in the law, I think there were eight that did it this year. That number might not be correct. Um, there were uh, at least 20 that introduced bills. Um, not all of them passed. A few of them did pass and were signed into law. Um, and, and I'll talk through what some of those are, but I wanna give you another place to do some of that local assessment. Um, and this will kind of be part of your discussion. There's a group called the Movement Advancement Project. And I like them because they are good at breaking down state by state what laws and protections exist. Um, for the LGBTQ community. And it's broken down in a lot of different categories. So you can see um, uh, relationship, family, marriage recognition. You can see um, non-discrimination laws. You see youth-oriented laws. Um, this year, they had to add a section about bills that were banning transgender youth from participating in high school athletics. Um, because that last year, there was one state that passed it. This year, there were those eight, like I said. And so this is helpful for you to know what's going on in your state, because quite frankly, a lot of this stuff doesn't make the local news. Um, it kind of just happens. And I'll be honest, I work at an LGBTQ organization and we could not keep up with all of them that were happening. And by the time we felt like we were formulating a response of what was happening in Arkansas, it was happening in Tennessee and Texas and Florida and West Virginia and elsewhere and elsewhere and elsewhere and elsewhere. Um, and Minnesota and the Dakotas, like all that. So, so you're in a better spot than I am because I tend to have to look at this stuff nationally. You can look and drill in and hone in your state. And if you use that link, you'll find you can drill in on your specific state and see what's there and what's not there. Um, so that's helpful. These laws that have um, been introduced, I, I wanna talk about those a little bit. The, the main laws that are youth oriented. One, as I mentioned, is a law that bans transgender youth from participating in high school athletics. I'm wording it that way. Um, you will see different types of language. Um, you will see folks talk about these bills and these laws as being ones that would um, have youth, uh, how do they word it, have biological boys be playing on boys teams. Um, that is essentially a ban for transgender youth to be able to play and to participate. So that's the one that got the most attention. Um, and a second one that passed in two states, Arkansas and Tennessee, I believe, um, was a ban on doctors performing, um, doing transition related care for transgender youth and actually turns doctors into felons. So let me break down the impact of these two bills. Even if they don't pass, even if they aren't, I mean, it's detrimental if they're passed and signed into law, um, but the discussion about them. One, the youth athletics piece. You know as well as I do that participation and belonging and peers are a part of a young person's development. High school athletics are one of those pieces that can do that. It's not that we are all sports people. I certainly wasn't. Um, but, uh, but, the, but bills like that actually cut off youth from being with their peers because most kids don't join high school athletics so that they can become the next Olympian or become a professional. They do it because their friends are doing it. They're doing it because it's character development. They're doing it um, because it's something that can help hone their skills and help them to push themselves to be as, as good as possible. 
Um, and, and that's what I think the intent of these laws are, is that it, it's a way of cutting off young people um, from accessing mentors and peers and skills that they could be developing for themselves. And I will give another recommendation. One of my coworkers uh, helped to produce a film that is on Hulu right now called Changing the Game. Um, I'm typing it there, but if someone has a link to the Hulu to put it there, please do. Um, this follows three high school athletes. A couple of them are the ones that often get named as the reason why these bills exist because they were track stars, they won a few meets, and everyone decided that they would have won if these trans girls hadn't won those couple meets. No trans people are dominating sports. Um, they're just competing like everyone else, and sometimes they win and sometimes they lose. So it's a good film that I highly recommend um, watching and especially if you're in a state where this is being discussed. I will say even the introduction of these bills tends to put young transgender people under a microscope, right? And makes them have to defend themselves. Similarly, other law that would uh, make it illegal for doctors to perform or to, to, do, to provide transition related care um, for youth now is also cutting off trans youth from supportive adults um, in their lives. A couple versions of these bills, I don't think these are ones that passed, also would put report supportive parents to Child Protective Services. Um, and so it was separating young trans people from caring adults in terms of medical care and in terms of parents. Um, and a lot of this stuff gets done with religious language. Part of this I want to try and tell you is to know what is happening so that you can um, so that you can talk about it in your congregation, in your youth group, and hopefully in your community publicly. Um, because this is a place in which to show up uh, at a school board meeting, at the rallies that are being held by your state organizations, at your state capitol, um, in those visits, um, in those conversations, to make sure that you are talking about your values, that God has created each one of our young people, and that they are imbued with life and dignity and are able to live and move and have their being. And who are we to cut them off from that? So the other thing I, um, I will add here to another link is um, I use often is for Freedom for All Americans, whereas Movement Advancement Project will tell you what laws exist. Um, Freedom for All Americans, this link I gave you, has a map of what bills got introduced in state legislatures. Um, it's not a perfect system. You kind of have to read into it to figure out what they're talking about. Um, but it's another place where you can click into your own state and then look up those bills that were listed, um, and you'll see the ones that are there. Um, someone here asked uh, if the doctor um, law was passed in Georgia. No, not in Georgia. It was Arkansas and Tennessee, I believe. And again, um, this... This has been a rapid fire year. So I'm hoping that what I'm saying is accurate because like I said, we kind of were like on one state and then jump to another one and then jump to another one and then jump to another one. Um, so I use those just to figure out what's going on and finding ways that these attacks have a faithful response. Um, and this is a way or a place that our churches can show up, can be present, that can put theological language behind creation, behind youth ministry, behind the character development that we that, that we hope that our young people are going to grow into becoming faithful um, adults who are members of society and healthy. Um, and this is a part of what we as a church do. Um, and, and I think it's most helpful if it comes from local sources. So think about where or how you can do that. Things like school board meetings, um, things like rallies. Look at those partner organizations that you're identifying in your state or in your community. Reach out to them and say, what's on your mind? What's important to you? And where or how can we as members of XYZ Lutheran Church help support and be a part of that? Um, then the other thing I wanted to mention with this too, um, since we're in the midst of this month right now, Pride is also one of those big public events. Have you all heard of Pride? Do you know? Some of you are in states that it's not actually Pride Month, but we all decided it's going to be the month of June. So here we are. Um, so some of you get two of them because you, you'll hear it in June and then you hear it again like in October. Um, so, um, so 
a lot of folks, a lot of churches also participate in Pride. This is also a great participation for your youth group. Um, and I want to just make a little note about this. I would encourage you to find a way to celebrate Pride, whether that exists for you in June or whether you're doing a different month. Traditionally, historically, it's June because um, it remembers the Stonewall riots, which happened the last weekend in June, um, like on the 28th. And so it's always been that weekend in New York where the Stonewall Inn was. Um, the march helps to remember uh, that the, those riots. Um, and so in a lot of places, they'll choose that date because of the historic significance. <laughs> if you're in the South, you might be choosing October or April because nobody wants to do a big march in the middle of the day in summer. Um, so you choose other dates. Um, and you really can. So, uh, so that's kind of where the two where the two come from. Um, even if you're not in a big city, find a way to commemorate it. Um, in fact, it's probably better to let people realize that the LGBTQ community does not only exist in large cities. Um, and and pride is celebrated in cities and towns and rural areas all over the country. They don't look like the gigantic parades that you see on TV from New York or from San Francisco or Los Angeles or DC or Chicago or Minneapolis. Um, you can absolutely go to those. They're fun. I've done a few of them. Um, but in your, in your town, it might be a picnic. If there isn't anything, a worship service is always a great thing to do and invite the community. Make that be your youth-led worship service. Um, and bring in all the artistry and creativity that exists, host the community, find ways to invite folks, bring them in. Um, also remember, Pride commemorates a riot at a time when the community was under pressure, was being arrested by the police for being LGBTQ was illegal. Um, there's aspects of it that are a celebration, but there's a lot of it that still is calling for what work still needs to be done. So I bring up the, every time I'm doing a bunch of pride stuff this month, and believe me, I'm doing a ton of pride stuff this month. Um, I still bring up those bills and just say, we're going into pride off of a really brutal legislative season that the LGBTQ community, especially the transgender community, especially transgender youth have felt like there's nobody on their side and in their corner. And I will say this to you, um, your rainbow, brand, uh, rainbow branded Uggs probably are not going to help them all that much. There's a whole discussion about corporate participation in pride. We can get to that. Um, we use that as a march. We call for stuff. We say this is what needs to happen. Um, if you need a specific call of what to happen, um, there is a piece of federal legislation called the Equality Act. Tell, Say that we need to get that passed. Contact your senators. It is US senators that could pass it right now. Um, and especially if you're in a state where they may not support it, they need to hear from you more than ever. But Pride is not the only LGBTQ moment. There are others. There are made up queer holidays that are scattered all throughout the year. There's a lot of, yes. Before we leave Pride, um, we do have a good question. Uh, so oh, yeah. I had a pastor friend from the LGBTQ community say that churches don't have a place at Pride. Is there anything we need to be aware of of choosing to be present at Pride? So, um, so now you're getting into the internal community politics, right? Um, in terms of, of who can be there and who can't be there. Um, res respectfully, I disagree um, with the person with, with the person who said that. Um, there's this is a bit of the tension in terms of the pride is often centered on the LGBTQ experience. A lot of allies, a lot of non-LGBTQ people come and participate in it. A lot of institutions come and participate in it. This is where the argument around corporations are a part of it. And I assume churches are a bit a part of that conversation as well. Um, don't think of pride as a marketing campaign for your church. Um, and I think that's one of those, like um, it, there's a thing of showing up. And, and if you're there and if you're present and if you're showing up for pride, but you're also showing up at the school board meetings and the state capitol and elsewhere, then people are gonna be aware that you are a place that does follow up on what you say. But for places that show up only for pride and then disappear for the rest of the year, often that's where the community says, this is not helpful to us. Um, and so be aware of the difference between marketing and this is still an extension of the values that you have lived out. And, and I write this in the book too. 
I mean, pride was created a time when we were rejected by every institution. And so it doesn't have religious roots in it whatsoever. I apply a theological lens, a faithful lens to kind of everything that I do. And so pride is a part of that. And I am the one that imbues a theological meaning into my participation with pride, which also means that's what I, it's the things that I choose to do. It's the things that I choose not to do. Um, it's the way in which I wanna show up and participate. Um, so, so I think that's part of the conversation. And no, there's always a tension, uh, tension between is pride specifically for the LGBTQ community and how much can or should allies be a part of that? I will err on the side of allyship is, is something you have to do. It's active um, and, and it's got to go beyond just showing up at pride. And I would say there are other ways and places to make sure that that same commitment is being demonstrated throughout the year. That's a good question. Um, I, I'm just going to quickly say before we go into the small groups is, um, so the other, other, other days, um, there's an appendix in the back of the book that tries to list a lot of these out. Um, October is LGBTQ History Month, um, and there's a bunch of holidays in there. There is National Coming Out Day. There is Spirit Day, which at GLAD we are a big sponsor of. Um, Spirit Day is a day to ask people to wear purple to oppose bullying. It's very youth oriented. Um, I love having churches participate there. Um, and, and we ask people to go purple and that can mean anything. You wear a purple shirt, um, change your logo, do something, be creative, do something to worship. It's on a Thursday, it's the third Thursday in October. So you can do something to worship before or after um, if you only do stuff on weekends or Sundays. Um, there's a lot of ways in which you can participate there. Um, and then this is because this is ever changing and evolving, I will tell you this too, there's a relatively new queer holiday. It's on June 30th. It is Queer Youth of Faith Day, which is being sponsored by an organization called Beloved Arise, which is focused on queer youth of faith, largely Christian, not exclusively. Um, I think this is their second year in existence. So you'll see it mostly online um, as a campaign. If someone, I don't have their link up right now, but if someone wants to drop Beloved Arise or Queer Youth of Faith Day in the chat, that'll help too. Um, but I will say, I got glad to uh, be a part of that day and an invitation I have for you is a panel that we're going to host at GLAD um, with interfaith leaders um, for Queer Youth of Faith Day. And so there is an invitation if you want to RSVP and sign up. I'm saying this while I was editing the invitation email for work with an intern, and then I'm just going to paste it in for you all while we're talking. So um, that's a GLAD event for Queer Youth of Faith Day, um, and you can learn some more about that. So. So there are ways, in, so this is the way that we need our churches to, to be present and to be known and to demonstrate our allyship. And it's gonna be through those commemorative days, what we do internal to the congregation, what that looks like outside. It will also include us being a active vocal part of our local community and being there at school board meetings and town hall council meetings and county board whatever, um, and perhaps asking for and pushing for laws or practices that are going to protect young LGBTQ youth. Um, and, and that's some of the consistency that I think is incredibly important and will counter the pervasive and uh, message that churches are unwelcoming and dangerous places for LGBTQ people. And the problem is we're fighting that message that comes from the LGBTQ community who have had really bad experiences or church trauma and from anti-LGBTQ Christian people um, that also want to make sure that their churches are unwelcoming places. We're not either, we're kind of in between those two, which means we have to be authentically ourselves and the way that we show up um, and the way that we speak out is going to be much louder than what we say about ourselves. This is about our action. So I've talked. Um, so I'm gonna give you two discussion questions as we go into a small group conversation. Um, look at those links that I dropped above, because one of the links is what pro or anti LGBTQ bills or laws exist in your state. Um, and if you want to use the uh, Movement Advancement Project just to kind of do a quick look or Freedom for All Americans to see what's been introduced in your state, that's good. Um, and then, you know, how can your youth ministry participate in pride from where you are or, or make that make sense for you as much as possible? Um, maybe you're in a city where, you know, you go to something, or maybe you have a way to, um, to, uh, 
uh, you have a way to uh, in sorry I'm losing my train of thought um, that you that you have a way to create something from your congregation that can be offered as a gift to the community. So I'm putting those two questions in the chat here. Um, I'm going to repaste per someone's request um, the two links. That is the Freedom for All Americans legislative tracker. And this one is the Movement Advancement Project Equality Maps. And those links actually work because they were full links. Um, we'll go in for about, let's say, like 12, 13 minutes um, and then come back. I would love to hear some of what you talk about in your small groups, but also if there's a point for questions that you have um, for me or conversation, we can go from there. Feel free to put stuff in your chat um, and we'll go from there. Great, thank you so much, Ross. This has been so helpful and we are sending you to breakout rooms right now. So please wait for your link and it will take you there. Cool. I don't know why I always worry about what content I'm going to say in here, and then I usually just end up running out of time. <laughs> That's pretty normal. I think I'm going to pause the recording then. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. So it's not just us talking to each other. Could have talked more if we knew that we were going to be the first ones here. <laughs> we thought we were behind. Nope. You are early, early. Glad to see y'all coming back. Glad to have you here. Welcome back. Thank you for being here. Yeah, let's hear. Are there some conversations about, um, I, I, I know a lot of you did some of your own like state assessment. I'm gonna skip over that question for us. It's sort of like if, if people have creative ways of pride participation that you either are doing or things that you could be doing, I'd love to hear those and hear the rest of the group. And we are small enough that you can probably unmute yourself if you need to. Well, I uh, didn't share in our group, but I'm in South Dakota and um, we have a Lutherans for Full Inclusion um, group, kind of grassroots style that's going to be gathering for Pride and Sioux Falls. Um, and cool. I think that's a way to be able to do that instead of it necessarily being individual congregations. Um, there are only two Reconciling in Christ congregations, I believe, in South Dakota Synod. Um, and so we're able to kind of do that at our own choosing then rather than at large for a whole congregation. I serve in mm -hmm. a campus ministry, and so we'll be um, looking into the future, we'll be looking at becoming Reconciling in Christ here, so. Okay, very cool, great idea. Kirsten, Kirsten. I had it right the first time, but, but okay. way to go. Way to give me up. I saw your I saw your hand, but I was scared of mispronouncing it, which is why I didn't say it. <laughs> it, 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 it worked. <laughs> so um, we just got a reconciling in Christ designation in um, oh, February, I think. And um, we've really been focusing on developing those relationships with 
local organizations more so than showing up at like some large general uh, mm -hmm. thing. So like we have a diverse and resiliency um, resource here that uh, it's, it's really awesome, but we reached out, had those meetings between our team and those uh, working there. They just started and they just opened a new mural. And like, uh, so a large number of people from our team went to be in support with that mural. Um, and uh, there was a, uh, somebody who had posted um, really offensive things uh, locally, and there was a rally for that, and we made sure that we were part of that rally. So each one of those things, um, and not really waving like the first, like not waving our church flag, just being there and just making sure that people are starting to see us more consistently but also reaching out for those events to say, how can we serve you? And uh, instead of you showing up for us to teach us and put it on you. So mm -hmm. the funny part is, is like what they asked of us is exactly what churches are good at. They're like, we need uh, bars and cookies, cookies, receptions and things. We're like, we are so on that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's really it. We're like, of like developing like genuine relationships mm -hmm. so that we can trust each other I think so that's um yeah that's great I yeah and it's coming up in the chat too I want to put a button on this too I think when I when I talked before about you know don't have pride be your marketing those kind of relationship pieces are incredibly important and sometimes sometimes we just show up as concerned like as as concerned citizens um who are a part of a church and organized through a church rather than let's make this an official you know congregational outing or setting i i've done some work with um synodical deacons and i and just you know i'm a deacon i don't put that in my title a lot but i also but i got ordained late and i went to seminary about 15 years before i actually got ordained um and so i'm pretty upfront with there's the institution we don't always need to wait for the institution to catch up with whatever we're doing and we can just go ahead and do it which is kind of what i was doing for about 15 years um and and i think that sort of encouragement is good of let's learn who's here what kind of relationships can we build with them do they know that we are a helpful resource and you know and how can we serve you and they come back with well this is what we need okay that's what we're able to offer and provide and um and i think the other thing that it does this is a great if they're asking for bars, this is a great intergenerational activity, right? So now you've got your youth group that's kind of being the, the lead, the liaisons, the points of contact. They're also um, probably pulling in those regular bar makers in the church, who I will guess are of a different generation, um, and can also help to do some of that education piece as well, which is great while a congregation is still learning how to live into a Reconciling Christ designation, or, if, or maybe even before you even think about being a reconciling Christ congregation, like this is the activity that can have us actually get to know and have real relationships with the community, us know them and them know us. I love that. Um, Chris, you mentioned here too, equity groups in the community and schools. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I have to be honest, I did a lot of asking of the questions because Andy and Jolene, Jolene, we're sharing Jolene actually is the one I was I was getting at a lot about asking questions, but she brought up a organic group at their high school. If I don't uh, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, that came up organically. And really, I was more interested in how that came to be, what it looks like. So I apologize. We didn't get to your mm -hmm. questions and they're awesome. But um, just I had a lot of questions, even with Andy, he was talking within their school district. So I was the question ask her while the other two were giving me all of their goodness and knowledge about those sorts of things they can answer that question more fully if they want okay um yeah do, do either of you want to talk more about what you brought up well i i brought up the fact that in our in our high school there was a a group of very brave individuals that came forward and said they were transgender said you know they 
were non-binary, they, you know, whatever label they put on themselves and just said that there isn't a lot of support for us. And mm -hmm. um, we have some very, you know, we live in a red district. Um, so there's a lot of hate and a lot of phobias. And they just said, you know, we need to find some help um, and want to receive support where we can. And we know there are, are people that are willing to do that. And so they brought it to our high school counselors, our social workers, our student resource officer, um, teachers, and they formed an equity group. And um, when I saw that it was an official group as a CYF coordinator for fifth through 12th grade at our local church, I'm like, I want in, <laughs> you know, I'm an ally. I, I want to know how to be a part of that and how to, to help support those um, individuals that, that feel like they weren't getting support and didn't have any place to go. So yeah, it was really awesome to see an organically grown um, from, from the people asking for help. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so great. That's great. Yeah, I love the coalitions. I feel like when the Naming Project started 15, 16 years ago, um, there was a, we were in the Twin Cities and the Twin Cities was creating like kind of a school district resource, but they were inviting these like non-school organizations like Outfront, the statewide organization. And, and I got the Naming Project to be a part of that as well and did a couple, you know, programming days, um, resources, making sure that that's an ongoing list. Um, if you can get on the ground floor and the creation of some of that stuff, it's incredibly, it's incredibly, it, it can be a great service opportunity for someone that's definitely got that passion that becomes the, the representative from the congregation or from the ministry. And it puts you in that network of relationships with who else is in your town or city or community. And I love that you did it in response to young people saying, you know, we don't feel safe. Okay, let's build something to try to build that safety around you. And our church was a part of it. Andy, do you have anything to add to that too? I know you got name checked. Yeah, thanks Russ. Uh, in our community, it was a little different. It, I was invited by the, uh, we call it the family engagement uh, team that's part of the equity group. Our, our, I think our district realized it was a little, sh coming up a little short in uh, cultural kinds of, of equity, but also other kinds and and just really wanted to address it head on. And so they've put significant resources. I mean, we, we get the, the superintendent at our most of our meetings and uh, and you know, our, our high school is about 2,600 people, so it's not a small school. And so, uh, it, it's, um, it, it's been an opportunity to interact with the community. There's a lot of religious presence in this community, but most of it's not affirming. It's a pretty mm. red area as well. And so, uh, and so there, but there's a tension because the district wants to be, and we are in Washington state and they know that, you know, that they know that too. So it's just, it's been an interesting conversation to be a part of it in the last, it's only been about six or eight months since I've been part of it, but yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I will say if you're in Washington state, a fun fact is that your um, the governor's LGBT liaison is a former Baptist youth pastor. Um, and he's a friend and contact of mine. His name is Manny Santiago. So he, he can bridge the LGBTQ world, the political world and the like churchy world as well. Which which is a hard world to bridge. I remember when I one of my first conversations with someone uh, um, you know, out here uh, who was talking about how hard it was to be part of a church because then the LGBTQ community excluded you and how hard it was, mm. to, you know, <laughs> and the church that she had grown up in excluded her uh, because she was LGBTQ. So, you know, yeah. it, it's just a hard uh, place to be in that intersection. Great. Great. Thanks. Other things, thoughts, questions, either from your um, discussion groups or if you had other things that you wanted to make sure that I talked about in the last few minutes that we're here. Sue, I see your hand up. I just want to say thank you, Ross, for reminding us to be more pol politically engaged. I think a lot of bills pass quietly and then we're kind of sitting here wondering what the heck happened and how did this happen? Because I think sometimes we fall asleep at the wheel on that. So thank you for that reminder. Much appreciated. Oh, absolutely. Well, and thank you again, because I'm in the position that I'm in, I tend to have this kind of national view, which honestly is, it's, we, we, we use this a lot at GLAD. It's like the game of whack-a-mole, like this thing pops up over here. And by the time we've dealt with it, it's popped up somewhere else. And so, and we're, 
we were, this is our, these are our morning meetings, sort of like, oh my goodness, this thing's happening in, Ar in Arkansas, a lot of terrible stuff happened. Arkansas, Florida, South Dakota, and South Dakota got doubly confusing because the governor vetoed it, but then issued an executive order that essentially said a very similar thing. It was, um, and so like, how do we track and getting introduced in states where like, is it really gonna pass? Do we have the energy to even talk about it in states where it's not gonna pass? So you will be a great local state presence. Um, I say this often at GLAD is that nobody from Tulsa, Oklahoma wants to hear me from New York tell them what to do about their community or how to report on their community. Um, so you are gonna be the much better local voices and resources that knows knows the community much better than than I do. Um, yes, I knew I had someone from Tulsa. Tulsa is my example city that I use, but uh, and I'm glad I have someone from here from Tulsa to, to, to note that. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, yeah. So along the lines of being informed. So one of the ways that I'm informed about some of the laws and I, I in the chat talked about um, Joe Manchin, who we all seem to harass about the filibuster. But um, one of the ways that I know about those things is through a daily email that I receive from another organization. So is there, Ross, is there either something from GLAD or another type of like just daily, just quick dose of what's going on right now that you recommend or that you read? Um, I'm reading What a Day from Pod Save uh, America, but, um, okay. but you know, like, what where where can we find kind of that little bits of just updates on some of those things and when the action needs to be done and how we can help yeah that's a good that's a great question so i think the two organizations that will be best for that i think for lgbtq stuff i'm going to kind of break it down there specifically one is freedom for all americans so that link i gave you with the map tracker if you click up to their home page um you can kind of find what else they're doing they're very much focused on non-discrimination type work and actions um, and their emails are good. They're doing a lot of, you've gotta be calling your senators about the Equality Act. I mentioned the Equality Act before. I, the ELCA has a, um, I know because it's part of this, has a tool to contact your senator. Calls are also really effective. Someone said that the opponents of the Equality Act are calling it a thousand times more than supporters of the Equality Act. So um, if it was just based on phone calls that senators are receiving, we are losing. Um, and, who said Joe Manchin? Joe Manchin doesn't support it yet either, so it's not even a full um, it's not even a full partisan effort. So freedom for all is a good one. The other one I would say would be the Human Rights Campaign, um, and they have a lot of state specific um, kind of uh, sections that that um, that can be helpful for it as well. Glad doesn't have a great political roundup. I do highly support looking at glad is so much more like media focused. So we, even though I talk about laws and bills, we're often about like, what's the news coverage or what's the um, even entertainment or comic books that are going to help to influence culture. So um, I should be, um, I should be promoting glad because they pay me. Um, and Andy, you mentioned Family Equality Council, which is a great organization too. They, they're going to be especially focused on stuff that's going to be for parenting, um, for youth. Do you have a, what more you want to say about that, Andy? Well, I, I just know they've been getting involved in it. And they're the kind of organization, because their name was Family Equality Council, they sound like they're based in Colorado Springs and doing exactly what you don't want them to be doing. They've actually dropped the council from their name. Now they're just Family Equality, but they are okay. for... Uh, LGBT Should not be confused with the families. Family Research Council. Exactly. I think that's. I think that's why. Um, but they do a lot to support uh, families that uh, you know that are headed by queer parents, and um, and are also paying attention a lot to uh, you know to the, to the laws and the things that are happening in states. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are probably the best ones that I would say. I gave you Glad's email. The other thing I would say is watching. Um, watching the social media for these places, which is gonna be faster than um, than looking for an email unless they're set up to do a daily thing. Um, if you're also looking for action, this is well beyond LGBTQ stuff. This may be slightly more partisan than it should be, but I am also involved with an organization called Indivisible, um, which kind of has national chapters. And it is a lot of local engagement that ladders up to national priorities. It's very much on the progressive side. Um, and what I like, uh, what I've like about them is they, 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 there's a book that you can read called We Are Indivisible, a little bit about their founding. It's people that kind of know how lobbying in Capitol Hill works. They used to work on Capitol Hill and says, this is what your power is as a citizen and how to wield that power 
effectively. And then there's little chapters. I'm part of Indivisible Harlem, because I live in Harlem. I'm also part of Indivisible International Falls, Minnesota, because I'm from there and I want to keep up with what's going on back at home. So I use that to, um, to follow up what's going on with them. And also Puyallup, Washington, because my mother-in-law is there. So, um, so those are kind of the ones um, to track and follow, especially those like, this is who to call, and here's the script of how to do that. Um, so I found really helpful ways to find chapters for stuff like that. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, I was going to give you a couple more if you didn't last week. Um, I, because I'm here, my two things I will plug. I'm going to give you two more URLs here. Uh, one is the naming project. We're doing, um, we're doing our summer camp at the end of July. It's going to be virtual um, because we were not in a good place to plan it. Um, yet when we had to plan the camp. So it's going to be shorter days. We're going to be doing care packages. If you have a young person that just wants to connect with community of other people from around the country, this will be a good place to do that. Um, you can check out stuff at namingproject.org. And then Made Known Loved is the website I kind of put up for the book. There's also a sign up for, um, uh, for an email list if you want to get some additional resources. I've been trying to send it every other week. In fact, I just sent one last night. Um, to have something to keep um, keep uh, keep communicating with folks that are interested in LGBTQ youth ministry and advocacy and kind of the stuff that we're doing. Um, so I encourage and invite you to be a part of that as well. And then I would say, if you're not already, the um, I'm really thankful for the ELCA uh, Youth Ministries and the Youth Gathering for sponsoring this, along with the Youth Ministry um, Network. And and they've really come together to make all of this happen. So if you are not supporting both of those organizations, you absolutely should as well. Thanks, Ross. Um, huge thanks to Ross for uh, giving his time for this book discussion. Um, it's just very generous of him as we obviously today go well beyond the book to some really local contextual helpful tools. And I did put in the chat box an eval that just helps us know if we're meeting your needs. And then next week, we will have a panel of people from a diverse group of backgrounds to discuss some of these topics as well. So again, feel free to always invite anyone else you know to participate. Uh, they don't have to have read the book to um, engage and be a part of the panel discussion next week. So we look forward to seeing y'all um, next Tuesday. Uh, thank you, Ross. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Have a good week.